Wuhan, China, the city from which COVID emerged, a virus that changed the world as we know it. Coronavirus started out as a bit of a mystery illness. Little was known about the irreparable harm that it was about to unleash. The first reported case was in Wuhan, traced back to as early as the fall of 2019. And within just a few weeks, it spread like wildfire. Okay, so we're here at the Wuhan airport in Hubei province. So this is the line for Canadians going back. It looks long, but it's moving quite quickly. Less than two months later, the first known infection outside of China was confirmed. Then the cases began popping up across the globe, mainly from people who had recently traveled to China. And in a flash, COVID arrived in Canada. The case is in a male who's in his 50s. He had traveled to Wuhan and within a day became quite ill. As the outbreak grew, local transmission became increasingly more common. That spawned mutations of the virus, creating new COVID variants, each one slightly different from the next, from Alpha to Delta to Omicron. We need to slow and stop the spread of this virus if we are going to come through this strongly as a country. COVID has touched all of our lives, whether it's a family member or a friend, a coworker, or even you. And that leads us to this moment, three years since COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Three years ago, so that was then, and this is now. Billions of cases later and millions of lives lost, and questions still remain about the origins of COVID. Hello, everyone. I'm Natasha Fata, and it's time to go in depth. Investigators have been trying to pinpoint where COVID first came from. Wuhan is central to that question. So-called ground zero of the virus, the original epicenter, depending on who you ask. One location is believed to be a local wet market. Chinese officials linked the initial outbreak of cases to that market, suggesting it may have started naturally, jumping from animals to humans. We know where the first cases of COVID-19 appeared in this pandemic, and they were all clustered around a specific seafood market in Wuhan. Early contact testing found traces of the virus on some surfaces in the market. Some likely pathways for transmission were identified, and all of them included bats. But as the virus went global, so too did another theory, the possibility of a lab leak. I came to believe, and I still believe today, that COVID-19 more likely was the result of an accidental lab leak than a result of a natural spillover event. Located not far from the wet market is the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It's known to experiment with coronaviruses. And as pressure mounted, the World Health Organization sent a team of international experts directly to Wuhan. Their aim was to get to the bottom of how COVID originated. The team of more than a dozen investigators initially considered the lab leak to be highly unlikely. But that outcome was inconclusive because when the WHO requested a second field visit to firm up their findings, China said no. And in recent weeks, both the U.S. Department of Energy and the FBI have come to their own conclusions that coronavirus likely resulted from a lab incident. However, based on newly classified intelligence, they can only make the judgment with low to moderate confidence. And CBC News has not independently verified the contents of those documents. There are still conflicting theories centered around both of these sources. One, was it zoonotic, meaning an animal transmitted the virus to humans? Or two, was it accidental, a leak from a Chinese lab that was never supposed to get out? This is still a hotly contested and highly political topic that requires deep explanation. So we're going to hear from the experts representing both sides of the debate. The first is Kerry Bowman. He's a bioethicist at the University of Toronto, and he has visited Wuhan. Kerry, thanks so much for making time for us today. Happy to do so. Kerry, let's talk about this. Why are you convinced that COVID-19 originated from this natural origin or the zoonotic origin? Well, 
you know, convinced, I, you know, I don't know, um, but none of us do. But my strongest belief is it absolutely did uh, originate from a zoonotic origin because, you know, coronaviruses have been doing this and zoonotic origin diseases of zoonotic origins have been elevating. Have, you know, the frequency has been rising. You know, SARS-1, as we as Canadians remember from 2004, three and four, um, you know, that 80% of the genome is the same as, as what we now have with SARS-2. So look, I don't know, uh, but none of us do. But, but here's the thing, Natasha, when I was in the Wuhan market, now that's one year before the outbreak, you could not have created more powerful conditions for zoonotic spillover. So what you had was, you know, I counted 52 uh, wild species within that market with many livestock domestic species as well. At the time, it was the height of summer. It was hot. There was high-powered hoses. There was blood. There was urine flying around. I mean, it was nasty. And this is exactly the kind of conditions that can create this. And it's not just China. The wildlife trade is happening all over the world. And when you combine that with, with climate change and the loss of tropical forests, we can expect these types of things. So what do you make of the fact that the novel bat coronavirus research, part of which was being funded by the United States, that research was being conducted in Wuhan, as you said, you were there just before, but yeah. it was, that research was happening in Wuhan at the time that the virus emerged. No, and you're exactly right. That, that is true. And within the Wuhan you know, virology lab, you've got an entire library of, of these coronavirus uh, things. But here's the thing it is, is, you know, most of the major Chinese cities have, have virology labs within them. And when you look around the world, if you look at a virology lab in, you know, let's say I was in Brazil last week, Brazil, they're going to be studying things like dengue and malaria and chikungunya. They're going to be studying viruses that affect uh, their geography. And, and so were the Chinese. So I don't find it that surprising. Let's talk about the lab leak theory, because even if most of the evidence seems to still indicate that this was is of zoonotic origin, there was quite a bit of ridicule and shutting down of the idea that potentially this virus developed as a result of an accidental leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. They are studying mm -hmm. these viruses there. Why do you think that debate has been shut down so hard? Well, we became very polarized during the pandemic. I mean, anyone that really didn't conform uh, really, you know, was shut down pretty quickly. And I think we created a very negative climate. And I don't think it should have been. I mean, I think to this day, everyone has the right to have this conversation about the origin. Um, but, you know, so that doesn't surprise me. I actually think in a lot of, you know, there was, we went too far with limitations on free speech, I would argue, during the pandemic. Um, and we made some mistakes, as I see it. Like? Well, you know, the vaccination programs, I mean, threatening to fine Canadians and making them mandatory. I mean, we really created, you know, a lot of political tension that we're living with to this day. But, Natasha, the thing that I find most powerful with all of this, and what is really, really lost, is, is Canada, and wisely so, is now investing a whole lot of effort and money on prevention. But when you look at what prevention really means for Canada, it's surveillance. We're doing nothing, nothing really to combat the fact that the loss of natural areas, climate change, the commodification of wildlife is what's driving this. And, you know, medical cultures just kind of have this firewall. When anything hits the environment, they just stop thinking or talking about it. And I would love it if we had, if the take home message from this is we really have a this is part of the environmental crisis that we all have to consider. You know, Carrie, I'd love to dig in deeper into that, but we're <laughs> going to save that for another day. I do want to conclude by asking you, because a lot of people will also say, well, why do we even need to know how this thing started when it's three years in? We need to figure out how to get rid of it. Why does the origin matter? Well, the origin matters because prevention matters, right? So, so that is it. And that, that's why I actually wish we could get to the bottom of it. I don't think we ever will. We don't know what the intermer intermediate host animal species was. But for prevention, we can't get to the bottom of it. And what I worry about is that the take-home message from this is just more anti-Chinese sentiment and more elevation of geopolitical tensions in the world as opposed to what can we all do environmentally uh, to step back from this crisis? Carrie Bowman, thank you so much for making time for us. 
You're very welcome. Now, as you just heard, those who come down on the side of the lab leak theory are often dismissed as fringe. But increasingly, some experts are speaking out. One of them is Jeffrey Sachs, who chaired the Lancet's COVID-19 Commission and is president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. I think a laboratory creation of SARS-CoV-2 and accidental release is the more likely explanation. The reason is that this virus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, is like other SARS-type viruses, so-called viruses, but that it has a very important added feature called a furin cleavage site. And that furin cleavage site feature was a very active target of research. In other words, what makes SARS-CoV-2 special was already identified as a core target of research before the pandemic itself. And there was one very important proposal in the United States made to the US Defense Department, a proposal called Diffuse, in which US and Chinese scientists proposed to insert a furin cleavage site into a large number of previously unreported SARS-like viruses. In other words, the diffuse proposal is a kind of cookbook for how SARS-CoV-2 could have emerged. The proposal was kept secret until it was leaked. That's another reason for concern. Now, given his defense of the lab leak theory, we did push Jeffrey Sachs to explain why he considers natural transmission to be a less likely source. Maybe the market hypothesis is right, but I don't view it as a very powerful explanation right now in view of the huge gaps. And I view the uh, presence unique presence of a furin cleavage site in the Sarbico virus. That is the only case of a furin cleavage site in a SARS-like virus being SARS-CoV-2. And the fact that this was a part of active research as being very important for further investigation. I don't think that the uh, papers on the possibility of the Huanan uh, market being uh, the origin are either persuasive or taking us very far to a conclusion. And they do not, in my view, uh, in any way uh, uh, remove the need to have a very serious look at what the scientists were doing with the SARS-like viruses in this U.S.-China cooperative program. And it's that point, that cooperation between the United States and China, that Jeffrey Sachs says we need to really understand when it comes to the lab leak debate. If this emerged in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, there's really a good reason to believe that it emerged with U.S.-designed technology and perhaps even with U.S.-China partnership. So while we should want and seek China's cooperation, absolutely. We have a lot that we can learn from the United States itself. I happen to believe that if the U.S. were also more straightforward and transparent about this possibility, it would make China less defensive because this is not, in my view, appropriately pointing the finger at China. This is indicating the possibility that U.S.-China scientific cooperation contributed accidentally to the laboratory origin of this virus. So in the absence of any clear-cut consensus, we asked Jeffrey Sachs about the idea of responsibility, of possible reparations for all the lives lost and all the damage that was done. I think if it happened that uh, this had a laboratory origin uh, on the basis of U.S.-China collaboration, I think that the U.S. and China should uh, absolutely uh, take responsibility, understand what happens, and take more responsibility of helping the world to prevent 
future disasters. We need to understand what is happening with this biodefense research or even biowarfare research by some countries. What is going on? And did such activity lead to the, I would say, accidental arrival of SARS-CoV-2? We definitely need to know this. Around 20 million people have died so far from this pandemic, so we want to know what happened, partly to know what happened, and partly to know how to stop a similar event in the future. Now, whatever the origin of this particular pandemic, something that most people do agree on is that we need to be better prepared. Dr. Isaac Bogosh is one of those people. He says another pandemic is inevitable and believes there is room for improvement. There will be a future pandemic. We know that. That's that's a certain. There have always been pandemics. The real question is, when is it going to be and what will the pathogen be? But we absolutely will have a, a future pandemic. We really did a mediocre job to perhaps a lousy job on some of the aspects of this pandemic. I think the, the key is appreciating that it's a global issue, not a local issue. We need early detection systems and we need much better global coordination to manage this. Uh, we did see that happen very well during this pandemic. To go deeper into how to better prepare for a future pandemic, we're joined now by Dr. Prabhat Jha. He's a professor of global health at the University of Toronto and an epidemiologist at Unity Health Toronto. Dr. Jha, thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Dr. Jha, let me begin by asking you, how prepared are we for the next big global pandemic? I think we're only modestly prepared. Uh, we know now from the SARS-CoV-2 experience that we can get worldwide, or at least in many countries, vaccinations uh, rolled out reasonably quickly, as we did here in Canada. However, we're weak on a few things. We're weak on global cooperation for surveillance, meaning trying to pick up potentially new pathogens reasonably quickly. We're weak on the fact that we don't have, in many countries, adult vaccination programs that are working not just during the pandemic, but during, during more routine uh, routine events. And you have to remember even something like seasonal flu, which kills perhaps 300,000 people worldwide. In Canada, the coverage is only about 40% among adults, and even those above age 65, who pretty much everyone should get it, the coverage is still only about 70%. So we have a long way to go before we get our adult vaccination program scaled up to be able to respond to the next pandemic. It has been three years since we've been in this as a planet. Shutdowns, lockdowns, restrictions, vaccines produced at unbelievable speed, incredible scientific breakthroughs. So why then do we still have this deficit? Why wasn't three years enough time to say, OK, next time we need to do this, this and this? I think there's a few reasons. One is that uh, there's a fair amount of distrust in part fed by uh, all of the mostly unhealthy debates on social media about uh, vaccines or more broadly about science. And many politicians have uh, tried to find some political cover in not very much sticking up for the science, uh, for example, on um, in terms of how well vaccines work. And to be fair, public health and public health communication started out strongly, but had its weak moments. For example, some of the confusion around masks and how effective they are. Um, we had conflicting evidence on how important are school lockdowns. And I think in retrospect, they should have been the last things to close, not the first things to close. So I think there are some lessons learned. I think one of the other reasons is worldwide, there still is a lack of coordination and resources going to the World Health Organization, which is our effectively our major global health agency, so that they can fight these pandemics very quickly. Governments are still reluctant to try to give enough resources to WHO so that they can fight the, the, the battle globally. And you have to remember, we can't fight this a global pandemic on our own. There's no way Canada could have fought this alone. 
We could not have just closed our borders because that doesn't work. We could not have uh, developed the vaccines because you need international science uh, uh, to do so. And similarly for things like rapid tests, which are um, also produced globally. So it's a global problem and demands global solutions, and we're still not there. Add on to that an unfortunate background of political distrust between US, between the US and China, which has fed into mostly unhealthy narratives about the origin of the virus. Mm -hmm. And all of those together leave us, um, as you rightly say, we should have learned very quickly from three years of how to prepare for the next big one, but we're not as optimally prepared as I think many of us would like. Dr. Jab, we just have a minute left, but as you rightly mentioned, the origin of COVID-19 is still up for debate. It is the purpose of this particular in-depth that we're doing. So let me ask you, whether it was zoonotic or whether it was a lab leak, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? It uh, almost definitely was zoonotic, and unfortunately the debate is being pitched like 50-50 uh, or he said, she said. It's unambiguous, pretty much, not definitive, but pretty much that the virus started in uh, from animals. And we have evidence from previous viruses that came from animals. We have geographic evidence that the spread occurred in Wuhan in the areas north of the Yangtze River, where the markets were, not south of the Yangtze River, where the lab is placed. We have genetic evidence that suggests that there's no way the lab could have produced uh, such, a vac such a virus. Uh, think about it as, can a, t can a garage take a Corolla and turn it into a Ferrari? Very unlikely, and it's the same analogy for the lab uh, that was in Wuhan. So I think it's been a very unhealthy debate, somewhat of a false equivalence that, oh, it was either zoonotic or it came from a lab. I'll admit it's not 100% definitive, but uh, it's strongly, strongly suggestive that the virus originated from animals uh, contacting humans in animal markets. Dr. Prabhat Jha, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Only time will tell before there is a definitive answer about the origins of COVID-19. This pandemic has been a common thread connecting all of us for the past three years. As the world reflects on this period, we hope to continue the conversation so you can be better informed. I'm Natasha Fata, and thank you for going in-depth with us.